This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream. Over the last few days, news has been breaking about yet another clash between Armenian and Azerbaijani forces, with it suggested that the clash resulted in the death of almost 100 soldiers. Then, on Tuesday night, Russia claimed that it brokered a ceasefire. However, with the conflict lasting for more than 30 years, it's worth looking into what the fighting is actually about and how the major international players have and are interacting with both parties in the conflict. Let's start by outlining the history of the conflict. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan declared their independence from the Transcaucasian Democratic Federative Republic on the same day, May the 28th, in 1918. Both states laid claim to some of the same territories, which didn't go down well. However, this fighting ended when both states were annexed by the Soviet Union in around 1920. The issue is that the region was and is populated by ethnic Armenians. The Soviet Union placed the region within the Azerbaijani SSR, but gave it some autonomy. While this was still an issue, given the fact that 95% of the population was ethnic Armenian, the USSR were able to keep fighting to a minimum. As the Soviet Union began to collapse in the late 1980s, the Nagorno-Karabakh Regional Parliament officially voted to become part of Armenia. Azerbaijan fought the Nagorno-Karabakh separatist movement, while the Armenians backed it. Upon the fall of the Soviet Union, this ballooned into full-scale war between the two. By 1994, Armenia had gained control of the region, before Russia brokered a ceasefire. As part of the ceasefire, Nagorno-Karabakh stayed as part of Azerbaijan. It has, though, been ruled by a separatist republic run by the ethnic Armenians and backed by Armenia. Clashes between the two sides still do occur sporadically though, and, as we mentioned at the top, such clashes have happened this week. In fact, these were the deadliest since a six-week conflict between the two nations back in 2020. The thing that separates this clash with those that have gone before is that this conflict didn't actually occur in Nagorno-Karabakh. It actually occurred in Armenia. Both sides have accused each other of starting the conflict, with Armenia accusing Azerbaijan of shelling towns near the border, including the likes of Jermuk, Goris and Kapan, requiring a response in turn, whilst Azerbaijan accuses Armenia of trying to sabotage the military positions of Azerbaijani Turks, known as Azeris. Azerbaijan then accused Armenia of using heavy weapons in violation of the Russian negotiated ceasefire we mentioned in the intro. Since then, more than 170 soldiers have died. Fortunately, later in the week, a new ceasefire was announced. Specifically, late on Wednesday night, it was announced by the Secretary of Armenia's Security Council that a ceasefire between the two had been agreed, but at the time of writing, there still technically hasn't been any confirmation of this ceasefire from the Azerbaijani side. It's worth noting that even assuming there is a new ceasefire, it's not guaranteed that it will hold. After all, the ceasefire failed within hours. In any case, this flare-up between Armenia and Azerbaijan has implications beyond the borders of the two. That's because Armenia is a part of the CSTO, or the Collective Security Treaty Organization. The CSTO is, to some extent, Russia's answer to NATO. The CSTO is, at its core, a military alliance, and like its counterpart, NATO, it has a mutual defense clause, Article 4. Under Article 4, an attack on one is an attack on all, with the other member states required to immediately provide help, including military support. In other words, following the triggering of Article 4, Russia, along with other members of the group, are required to come to Armenia's support. And, well, it's not exactly the best timing for Russia. Russian forces are currently struggling to retake positions in Ukraine. As such, it's just not clear that there's enough capacity for Russia to send over hundreds of troops, let alone the required military equipment to support such a deployment. Even assuming there is capacity troop-wise, it's also not clear whether there's the political will and desire to do so. Beyond the CSTO potentially demanding troops from Russia, the conflict also doesn't look good for Russia on another front. The very fact it's happening. That's because Azerbaijan and Turkey are close allies. So, any escalation of the conflict from the side of Azerbaijan would more than likely have to have been run by Erdogan beforehand. 
Now, if the relationship between Erdogan and Putin was relatively hunky-dory, you'd think that Erdogan would have warned off Azerbaijan, or alternatively, condemn them for progressing with any planned attack. Given that Turkey's defence minister has already come out and called out Armenia for its aggressive attitude and provocative actions, almost certainly means that Erdogan did indeed sanction the attack. Erdogan would have done so full well in the knowledge that it would end up, at the very minimum, annoying Russia and at worst dragging them into a proxy war. In fact, there is an argument to be had that the conflict has reignited not in spite of Russia's role as a regional security guarantor, but because of Russia's role as a regional security guarantor. Prior to its invasion of Ukraine, Russia was considered to be close to, if not a military superpower. It was widely expected that Russian forces would very, very quickly be able to overturn Ukrainian defences and occupy much of the country, something that just did not happen. The war in Ukraine has shown the fallacy of believing in Russia as a rock of stability and security in the region, and exposed major flaws in Russia's military apparatus. Flaws that, it seems, have opened the door for Azerbaijan to be more bullish when it comes to resolving what, in their eyes, remains to be an unresolved territorial dispute. So it seems like the flaring up of the Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict has raised some difficult questions for both Turkey and Russia and their relationship with one another. With both Russia and Turkey on opposing sides in the conflict, and given that Erdogan probably sanctioned Azerbaijan to make the attack, there is certainly an argument that this conflict demonstrates that Erdogan is cooling on Putin. The conflict itself is also looking as though it's cooling with a ceasefire currently in effect but this could fall apart as other previous ceasefires have. Unfortunately, it just doesn't seem as though this wider conflict will be drawing to any conclusion anytime soon. If there's any other major updates or escalations, we will be covering it here on TLDR Global though. If you just can't wait for more TLDR to find out, then you can find more exclusive TLDR content exclusively on Nebula. That's the streaming service we created with our creator friends and where you can find a bunch of TLDR videos which never make it to YouTube. You can also find all of our other videos there ad-free and get some of our videos there early. Signing up really helps out the channel and helps us make more content, not only for Nebula subscribers, but everyone else too. So if you want more from us and to support the channel, then you can get it for less than $15 a year if you sign up to the Nebula Curiosity Stream bundle. Let me explain. We've partnered with the superb streaming service Curiosity Stream, where you can find some superb documentaries about all kinds of fascinating topics. If you sign up to their service, you'll get Nebula absolutely free. That's both streaming services for just over a dollar a month. A crazy good deal to get all those documentaries on Curiosity Stream and also more TLDR on Nebula. Thanks for your support.